Welcome to the Modern Software Engineering Channel, purveyors of fine hop technology advice for building better software faster, and thoughts and opinions on our industry. This content is made possible by our wonderful sponsors, Equal Experts, Transfic, and MailTrap. Do check them out in the links below. The recent AWS and Azure outages got me thinking about supply chains and resilience, and how we often leave ourselves vulnerable to third-party outages, as well as ransomware attacks or less obvious risks like accidental data corruption or leakage of personal information. Sam Newman already discussed the details of the AWS incident on this channel, which you can find in the links below. I want to look more broadly at software supply chains and share some techniques for visualizing them and making your systems more resilient. If you think about supply chains at all, you probably think of them in the context of manufacturing or retail. They're the goods and services from your partners and suppliers that ensure that a factory can assemble a vehicle or that the fruit makes its way to the supermarket shelves in time and in one piece. But that's just the initial supply chain. Once a product is in the customer's hands, there's a second supply chain to consider, which is the runtime supply chain. These are all the moving parts that a product needs to operate successfully. Physical goods often have a tiny or non-existent runtime supply chain, so we tend not to notice it. If you're driving a car, you're making use of roads, road markings, and traffic signs, which are generally reliable, notwithstanding potholes and roadworks. You also have electronic infrastructure like traffic lights or signage, but these are mass produced to be boringly mechanical and reliable. Your food might use some cooking infrastructure or may come ready to eat. Clothes need no runtime support at all. Conversely, any software product has a runtime supply chain that ranges from the relatively straightforward to the mind-bogglingly complex. At the very least, you have an operating system running on a server, which may itself be virtual, in which case there's a hypervisor, then the physical server sitting in a data center somewhere, which needs electricity and water to even function. When you stand back and squint, your carefully crafted code is balanced precariously atop a fragile tower of runtime dependencies, as depicted in the famous XKCD dependency comic. There's a third supply chain, which is around maintenance. For your clothes, this would be the washing machine that its dependencies say. In a continuous delivery world, the construction and maintenance supply chains are pretty much the same thing, so we can roll them in together. So now we've met the supply chains, let's talk about resilience. There are several operability words that sound similar, but mean different things. Reliability, resilience, robustness. Briefly, reliability is about whether you can trust the system. Do you get the same answer each time? And is that answer correct? Robustness is about whether you can rely on the system. Is it available when you need it? Resilience is the interesting one, for me at least. This is about how a system responds to perturbations, which are unexpected changes in its operating environment. Does it bounce back like rubber, or does it shatter like glass? Resilience asks whether you can stress the system. Perturbations take many forms. They can be malformed inputs, out of range data values, unexpected environment changes, infrastructure outages or power dips, or in the case of the AWS failure, an empty DNS file erasing a key lookup table. These perturbations can be accidental or deliberate, a brownout in the data center, or a maliciously crafted network packet. The question is how your system, which includes its entire runtime supply chain, reacts to the unexpected. This kind of analysis has a lot in common with threat modeling. But in this case, rather than looking through a security lens, we're thinking holistically about the system behavior. So how do we get a handle on all this? Well, you can't manage what you can't see. So the first order of business is to visualize your supply chains. But how do you visualize a supply chain? To answer that, we need to talk about value streams. The idea of value streams and value stream mapping has been around since at least the 1950s, but they came to prominence in the software world when the music streaming startup Spotify started talking about tribes and guilds back in 2012. A tribe represented a customer-facing value stream, say recommendations or the Android player, and a guild was a virtual community across the tribes, representing all the testers, say. Then the team topologies folks popularized the term with their value stream aligned teams. The value stream then is the sequence of work, including materials, information, resources, people, and knowledge that contribute to creating value. From when you commit to doing something to the point you hear, thank you. A value chain is a network of these value streams, all converging to create value for some customer, meeting a need or helping them get a job done. From raw materials to a smiling face, to model a supply chain, the first thing to notice is that supply chain is just a way of referring to the parts of a value chain that you don't control. It turns out that we have some great techniques for modeling value chains, and I want to share a couple of them with you now. The first is called Wardley mapping, named after its inventor, Simon Wardley. A Wardley map has vertical and horizontal axes where the value chain flows from bottom to top, with the customer at the very top of the diagram. When you build a Wardley map, you work from the happy customer downwards, building the dependency chain of every component or service involved, typically ending up at the fundamental ingredients of electricity and water. Working from left to right on the Wardley map tells you who provides the component or service, starting at in-house invention on the left, known as Genesis, 
through custom and vendor or product until you get to commodity or utility on the right. As you travel from left to right, you're trading off control for effort. It's usually easier to plug in a third party library than write something from scratch, but you're now at the mercy of the vendor. As an example, let's say you have a booking website and you want to model the value chain of making a booking. The customer wants to book something which requires a web app. You probably started with an open source web framework, which is a product, and write your own app on it, which is custom. A booking might use your secret special allocation algorithm, which is Genesis. The web app runs in a cloud server, which is utility compute, access through cloud provided authentication, again a utility. You may have written the booking gateway yourself, which would be a mix of Genesis and custom software. And for security reasons, you might deploy this in your own servers, vendor, in a service data center, also vendor, running a commercial database product, vendor again. So you start at the top with a customer and the booking app and model downwards, placing each new dependency in the appropriate place on the horizontal axis, depending on who's providing it. The real power of a Wardley map is in scenario modeling. For each component, what would happen if you moved it right or left? What if you replace that utility compute with your own tin? How much is it costing us to maintain that brittle pricing algorithm that we wrote long before that open source library even existed? How much control would we be giving up if we migrated to that? This would represent a shift from Genesis or custom to a product component. Wardley maps are a fantastic tool for this kind of analysis. You can take a piecemeal approach or look at entire clusters of subsystem as you think through different resilience scenarios. What kind of perturbation could knock out this part? How could we plan for that to mitigate risk? How does shifting it left or right change the risk and cost profile? One of my favorite aspects of Wardley mapping is the insights it can reveal. One client was stuck on a decision about whether to form an in-house data team. Would this create a bottleneck or a center of excellence or both? What would the trade-offs be? They have been deadlocked on a decision for weeks with increasingly entrenched factions arguing for and against centralizing their data knowledge. We Wardley mapped a few complex data scenarios. This was for a trading firm that had lots of different kinds of proprietary trading and quickly realized that two distinct scenarios are emerging. For one kind, a data team was exactly what they needed. For the other, it would have been a disaster. Armed with this new insight, they set up a small opinionated data function just to handle this one type of scenario. And they were able to identify which use cases should go via the data team and which ones should be federated into the individual teams. The whole exercise took less than a half a day. And as an unexpected benefit, the client adopted Wardley mapping as a core in-house modeling technique. The other technique I want to share with you is event storming, which is the brainchild of Alberto Brandolini. As a sidebar, this is the same Brandolini who coined Brandolini's law or the bullshit asymmetry principle, which is that the amount of energy needed to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude greater than that required to provide it. Event storming emerged from the domain-driven design community, and as the name suggests, the exercise is about modeling the domain events that make up the value chain, along with related actors and systems, using the ineffable power of sticky notes. I describe the goal of event storming as getting to everybody knows what everybody knows. You're making tacit knowledge explicit and surfacing misunderstandings and ambiguity, especially when two people know how this part of the process works and they have different opinions. For a successful event storming session, you want to gather everyone involved in the value stream, meaning people with answers, people with questions, and someone with lots of stationery. You're gonna get through a lot of stickets. You start by taping a length of butcher paper to the wall, more than you think in either direction. Then you draw a timeline along the wall from commitment to thank you. You should leave a decent margin at either end because the group is likely to end up exploring things that happen before the story starts and after it ends. From here, all the participants will model the parts of the value chain that they know using different colors to represent domain events, actors, and so on. Rather than get into the details here, I've linked to a fantastic talk by Alberto in the notes below. I have a talk of my own called Event Storming for Fun and Profit from a recent conference, but it isn't online yet. I'll be sure to update the description below when it's published. The thing I love about event storming is the energy. You get a group of people modeling a process or a system in real time, discussing, arguing, learning, discovering. You sometimes end up with more questions than answers, but at least people start to realize that they didn't know what they didn't know. Okay, so now we have event storming and Wardley mapping in our back pockets as tools for modeling supply chains, but then what? How do we reason about risk? Let's look again at our build and runtime supply chains. For the build supply chain, we can lean on automated testing. You are writing tests for your code, right? In this case, we aren't looking at the behavioral tests of TDD or BDD, but at the discipline of performance testing, and specifically stress testing. There are many branches of performance testing. Load testing ensures the system will cope with expected usage, usually with a generous margin. Soak testing runs the system for many hours or days to check for resource leakages or drift. One of my favorite ever JVM bugs contains the phrase, emerges after two weeks of soak testing. I want that tester on my team. Stress testing tells us how a system fails when it eventually does. I know we can support 10,000 concurrent users, but what happens as we dial that up towards a million? Does it degrade gracefully or does it back off exponentially? Does it fail catastrophically or is there some scary gray area 
where it still appears to be working but is returning corrupt data or accidentally sharing user credentials. Perturbation theory and threat modeling tell us that the interesting behavior lies at the edges in the liminal spaces, so we should concentrate our efforts there. Remember, if you don't know how your systems fail, you can't start to mitigate the risk. The runtime risk story has improved dramatically over the last decade or so, with folks like Netflix alumna Nora Jones and serial tech legend charity majors driving Chaos Engineering and Observability 2.0, respectively. Chaos Engineering is exactly what it sounds like, injecting chaos into a running system. Pioneered at Netflix by Nora and her team in the 2010s, Chaos Monkey would routinely switch off servers and entire services so that teams could see how the systems responded to unplanned outages. Observability 2.0 is the shift of runtime observability from being an operations concern to a development one. If you don't design instrumentation and telemetry, meaning runtime signals and the ability to transmit them, into your systems from the start, it makes it much harder to know what's going on at scale. So there we have it. Your software supply chain is just the parts of your ecosystem that are outside of your control. You have a supply chain not just for build, but for your running systems, and it's this that is vulnerable to cloud vendor outages. And you cannot know how your system will respond to perturbations in that supply chain unless you visualize them from the user's eyeballs right through to the power supply. So get out there, visualize your supply chains, and let me know how you get on in the comments. Let's be careful out there. If you found this useful, let me know by hitting the like button, and please subscribe to the channel for more content like this. Thanks.